the grant uh, info session so that it can be available online to folks that weren't able to make it. So I, I have started the recording now. Uh, I've also muted everybody. Um, if you do have a question, you can do two things. You can either let me know that you have a, a question uh, by typing it in the chat box and I'll check it periodically. Um, or you can just tell me that uh, you have a question and that you like to ask it and I can unmute you um, to ask that question. So you can either ask it in the chat box directly and I can respond or I can, I can, you can ask to be unmuted and uh, I can do that for you too. So either way works, um, pretty informal here, either way. Um, but I do have some slides to keep myself organized, um, make sure I hit on some of the import, important topic, important points that I wanted to share with everybody today. And uh, lastly, I apologize for my voice. It was much worse yesterday on the info call, so it's a good thing you're calling today and not yesterday. I'm um, just getting over uh, a, a cold or a flu or something. Um, but anyway, I sound a lot worse than I actually am, uh, <laughs> so don't worry. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Let's see, let me just check the chat window, make sure, okay, so we are good to go. And if you can't hear, or there's a, a technical issue, um, please, um, you know, put that in the chat window as well. That's the best way for me to to know what's going on since I have muted everybody. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So um, let's get started. So the office of uh, office of the state superintendent of education. Um, we're now called the division of health and wellness. We have a new name as of a couple weeks ago. It's different on the grant. It says Wellness and Nutrition Services on the grant. In case you were wondering, uh, we had a name change. We have a new assistant superintendent here, uh, and some, some good things are happening. Um, we are excited to have the fifth uh, round of the DC School Garden grant for 2016-2017. Um, and um, I'm, I'm excited about what we have in store. Um, and as um, there's more information, and all the information is on the School Garden Grant, grant excuse me, webpage, um, and the URL is there on the screen. So let, <clears throat> let's see here. Let's get started. Um, just a quick overview. If you're new to the School Garden Grant or um, School Gardens in general, the purpose of the grant is to increase, um, really, to increase the capacity of school gardens, whether they're new school gardens that um, are going to be established in DC schools or existing school gardens um, that, oh, let me put someone on mute here, that, uh, oh, okay, uh, new school gardens that uh, want to be established or existing school gardens that want to continue the work um, and increase the capacity of those existing gardens. And we are really focused on three things promoting garden-based learning in one, the classroom, two, in the school garden, of course, and then thirdly, in the cafeteria. And we really wanna see the connection between those three uh, venues um, and see garden-based education woven through them. So when you're writing your grant application, really think about how those three things connect. That's very important. Um, also, it's important to know that um, you know, the Healthy Schools Act, many of you are probably aware, um, provides not only the funds to um, make awards possible for this grant, but also provides um, the school garden program in, in general, provides the structure for the school garden program in, program in general and all the support. So this program and the grant are both a part of the Healthy Schools Act. Um, the, the focus of this grant is on the staffing. We call those people school garden coordinators. Some people call them garden educators, garden, educators, garden teachers. Really, it doesn't matter. Um, we're all talking about the same thing. This is a person who is the primary point of contact, the sole person who is primarily responsible for maintaining the school garden and providing garden-based instruction to the students. It doesn't mean they're the only person doing it, but they are the person who is um, in charge, for lack of a better word or phrase, of, of the garden program at the school. Okay. Um, great. Okay, so what's new? 
Um, this year we have a couple of new things that I wanted to let folks know about. First of all is this increased focus on the environmental, environmental literacy component. So as many of you probably know, we have added a new program on our Healthy Schools Act initiatives team, and that is the Environmental Literacy Program, um, which is part of the Healthy Schools Act. And because, and, and as a result of that new program, we would like to see folks engage students in the garden um, in a little bit of a different way, um, not too different, but a little bit different. We would like to see at least one grade level from each school, um, the students in that grade level be engaged in at least one MIWI, Meaningful Watershed Educational Experience. So a MIWI, can be anything that the students are doing that are, that's hands-on in the garden engaging with the environment. That's it, it's that simple. Um, one, one, one thing that I would recommend though is if um, students are doing something that is more nutrition focused like um, harvesting anything in the garden, yes, that could be an environmental a MIWI, but it's also a nutrition, uh, part of a like nutrition piece. So I, I would encourage folks to sort of think outside that, that box of harvesting um, something uh, from the garden to eat and think about how they could expand their garden program to include more opportunities for environmental education. So things like pollinator gardens, um, uh, rain gardens, um, habitats, things like that that really tie in the ecosystem into the garden. That, that's really what we're talking about. Um, we also are providing some clarity and some additional guidance for DCPS campuses um, that are looking for fiscal sponsors that don't currently have one. So we've come, in, we've come to problems in the past where a DCPS campus, a school, um, struggles with finding a fiscal sponsor because either their PTO does not have 501c3 status or they cannot find a community-based organization to serve as the fiscal sponsor. The solution to that that we uh, have found is that a DCPS central office is willing to serve as the fiscal sponsor for those schools um, that, that aren't able to find a fiscal sponsor. So there's information in the RFA on contacting the um, central office so that they can get the ball rolling on that and the deadline is tomorrow to do that. So I would recommend to folks if you are a school, a DCPS school and you're not sure who your fiscal sponsor is going to be, that you that you reach out by tomorrow and just in an email um, to and the emails in the RFA that you're interested in a fiscal sponsor, of them being a fiscal sponsor. Um, next is the indirect cost. So last year Everybody received the same indirect uh, cost rate, and I believe it was 10%. Um, this year, um, you need to apply to a third party to then receive an indirect cost rate. So um, a third party will determine what your organization's indirect, indirect cost rate is. It may be higher than 10%, it may be less than 10%. Um, but it's important to know that if you do want to submit for indirect costs, you do need to apply ahead of time to receive that rate. Um, and then lastly, we gave some clarity on the number of lessons that we want to see taught in the school garden. In the past, we didn't specifically say a number of school uh, lessons that we wanted to be taught. So this year, we're saying 20. We want to see 20 lessons being taught in the school garden this year at a minimum. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna keep going. Okay, who should apply? This is pretty straightforward. This is all in the RFA. Um, the important thing to know is that the, the um, organization or school applying must have the credentials to submit the application and to also uh, submit reimbursement requests. So this means that you have um, access to the EGMS electronic grants management system. So if you're a classroom teacher and you're trying to apply for this grant, it's not going to work because you don't have credentials to um, apply through the EGMS system. If you're a teacher, you need to reach out to your grants manage manager or to if you're in a charter school or your administration in your school and let them know that you're interested in applying. 
um, that, and that you need someone with the EGMS credentials to actually submit the application. Okay. Um, again, eligible organizations, we are going on a little bit on the honor system this year because the school health profile is due after the application deadline for the school garden grant. We are, and we are requiring that schools submit a school health profile in order to be eligible. So we're just asking that you do your school health profile and um, we won't have any problems. But you will see in the EGMS application, it does ask on the eligibility checklist, um, it'll say, has your school completed the school health profile? You probably hadn't completed the school health profile yet because it wasn't due, unless you're doing things ahead of time, which is great. So you're going to check yes, and then you're going to make sure that it gets done in the future. That's all, we're, that's all we can do. Um, and then the second piece is um, you're eligible if you have not received more than three awards in a five-year period. Okay, so we had a couple of questions here. My little thing is flashing. Um, yeah, so the question is just around like the number of lessons that we're asking to be taught, and that number is 20. So it's 20 lessons total for the whole grant. So if you have a whole school that you're working with, it's a minimum of 20 lessons with that whole school. Great. Okay. So um, here are some important uh, dates to remember leading up to the grant period beginning. I'll show another timeline that starts from the grant period beginning and on just so people get a sense, but this is sort of the immediate stuff. So, um, so to, like I said, tomorrow is the deadline to submit um, your intent to apply if you're a DCPS school looking for a fiscal sponsor and you need to submit that to DC, DC, DCPS central office by tomorrow. Just a quick note saying that you're interested in applying so they know. Um, and again, that email's in the RFA. And then um, this was a typo in the RFA, and thank you for folks for bringing that up, but there were two dates for the deadline to submit questions. Um, there was a date that was for tomorrow, and then there was a date for the 15th. We're gonna go with the later date on January 15th, so you have until that time to submit any questions um, after that date, if you're going to ask questions, we're, we're, we're not really, we're not going to be able to answer them. Um, we will put out an, a, an FAQ page uh, shortly after the 15th and publish it online on the grants page for everyone to see. Um, but we just can't answer questions leading up to the last minute because it just gets too crazy. Um, so we're giving you guys plenty of time for that. Um, and then the 29th is the big day. It's the uh, submission deadline. Um, at 3 p.m., not 5 p.m., that's a change from last year. And then on, on, the, on March 7th, you'll get your grant award notifications, and on the 14th, the grant period begins. Okay, I wanted to go through some of the funding restrictions just to add some clarity to the RFA. So things that are not allowed, travel expenses are not allowed. And when we say travel expenses, we're talking about um, a flight and a hotel and per diem to go to a conference, either for yourself or for a group of students, that is definitely not allowed. Um, a, a school bus for a field trip for students is also not allowed. Um, any expenses related to travel, like meals or accommodations or per diem are not allowed. Um, also not allowed are any activities that are funded through our other great grant program called the Farm Field Trip Grant, which will pay for your students to go on a bus and visit a farm. So if you're interested in going and visiting a farm as a part of this grant, I highly recommend that you apply for the Aussie Farm Field Trip Grant to, to be able to do that funding. And it's great because that's more money um, for you to you know, spend on your garden program. All right, so those are the things we can't, that are not allowed, things that are allowed, of course, stipends and salaries, Remember, the minimum of 80%, a minimum of 80% of your total grant amount must go towards staffing of your school garden coordinator. Now, there's a plural there for the coordinator because some schools or organizations actually have multiple school garden coordinators, and that's fine. Um, if you have you know, two school garden coordinators, their, their salary combined or their stipends would, you know, need to add up to at least 80% of the total grant funds. 
The remaining 20% can go towards materials, supplies, any professional services. So if you're contracting out for design or you're contracting out for a training or for someone to manage your compost bin, beehive, or chickens, then that's where that goes for. And then food, most food is allowed. Um, there are restrictions mostly around it needs to be nutrient-dense, healthy food, um, pref preferably local, preferably fruits and vegetables. Um, it's all in the RFA. So um, just check that out, but food is allowed. Okay. Um, okay, so just some clarity around the fiscal sponsor. So um, each, each applicant must have a fiscal sponsor that has 501c3 status that, um, so, so that would be either the LEA, so that would either be DCPS Central Office or the Charter School LEA. Um, it could be an, a community-based organization. It could be a school PTA with that status. All of those organizations and entities can serve as fiscal sponsors. The fiscal sponsor has access to the EGMS system. They, their responsibilities are submitting the application and also submitting reimbursement requests. Again, I already said this, but I'm just going to say it again. If you're a DCPS school, you should contact DCPS Central Office to request, um, you know, fiscal sponsorship if you don't already have one. Um, some people, you know, there, I, I feel like the fiscal sponsorship is a big challenge for some folks because they they really want to do a school garden program, but you know, they just they don't have a partnership with a with a community-based organization that has the capacity to serve as a fiscal sponsor. Um, so, and they don't have a PTA or PTO that has the 501c3 status. So um, I think that the important thing with the fiscal sponsor is that they have the ability to manage the grant through EGMS and submit reimbursement requests. Um, they don't need to be uh, experts in school gardening. They don't need to be a garden-based organization. They don't need to provide technical support. They're just there to do the administrative work through EGMS. They're the mechanism by which we can pay for the pay the garden coordinator for the work that they're doing. Okay. Um, in terms of application submission, so again, EGMS, we used to sub, um, accept emails. I used to get like faxes of applications. That is done. That's no longer happening. Everything's going through the EGMS system. It's much easier because you can see that it's been submitted. You don't have to lose sleep over whether or not the facts went through. Um, it's all very transparent, as well as the reimbursement process. You can see that things have been submitted, where they are, that you've been paid or you've not been paid. This made things a lot easier. Um, in the application submission, it's very typical if you are, fami are familiar with EGMS, which most of you probably are. Um, so there's a few sections. The first section you're gonna see when you're submitting your application is the school eligibility question. So that's where the, the, the question about the school health profile resides. So that's where you're gonna say, yes, we're gonna submit our school health profile even though the due date is after the submission deadline. Um, and then it's also gonna ask you if, you if the school you're applying on behalf of has received the award three, three times in the last five years. And you're gonna say no. Unless you have, then you're gonna say yes and then you don't get to apply. Um, it's gonna ask you contact information. The emails that you put in the contact information are the emails that we're gonna use throughout the grant process to contact. So be careful about, you know, think about this is the person who's, you know, whose email you put in there and who's actually running, being who's actually the grants manager and who's actually the school garden coordinator if you know who the garden coordinator is gonna be. We can change that stuff later down the road, but those are the people that are going to be notified automatically when, um, like, when you get the award or when things ha when we need inf information. That's the contact we're going to be using. Okay, um, and then the, the next uh, section is the narrative. This is the chunk that you've already written ahead of time in Microsoft Word and poured your heart and soul into, and now you're just ready to cut and paste into EGMS, and it's under the word count and it's concise and clear and is really great. Um, and then the next section is the detailed planning expenditures, also called the budget. Um, so this is where you're gonna enter in your budget details for the salaries, for the materials, 
And when you go into EGMS, you'll see that each, um, each category has a code. So you can submit for a school garden coordinator um, to um, get, 10, say, $10,000 for doing instruction or for program management. So you need to code it depending on what that person's doing. So if they're teaching in the garden and you would code it as instruction, and if, but if they're you know, maybe working with teachers more and not so much in the garden, then maybe that's program management, for example. Those things can change as you, know, you can submit budget um, um, changes later down the road, but that's just something to, to look out for. And then the last thing are the assurances. So you need to sign off on the assurances and the terms and conditions, and then you can submit your application to Aussie, and then you're done. Um, Oh, but before you're done, you need to make sure that you have these four pieces of supporting documentation. Um, the, I will say that the photos, people ask a lot of questions about the photos. Um, I put it in there because I thought that it added some depth to the application. So if you're going to build a new school garden and you know where it's going to be built, let's see it. Take a picture of it. It'd be great to know and put some images, um, you know, have some images to put this into place. If you have an existing garden program and you can get, take pictures of the kids, it'd be great to see them working. Whatever you think is going to enhance your application. The letter of commitment it can be a simple form letter signed by the principal and the partner organization. So the partner organization um, and the principal we know are working together on this project and that you know, we, it's clear what each um, uh, entity is doing. And then secondly, an agreement so that we know that um, you guys are on the same page in terms of uh, uh, what the responsibilities are. So the letter of commitment and the agreement can be, sorry, the letter of commitment and the agreement between the school and partner organization are often one and the same thing, but they can be separate things. So there's an example where you may have a letter of commitment between the principal and the partner organization, and then you may have a more formal MOU between the school, uh, so like DCPS, maybe school's the wrong word there, between DCPS central office, for example, or the LEA and the partner organization. We put that in there intentionally because um, sometimes we just have the letter of commitment, but it's between the principal and the partner organization, and then the principal leaves, and that commitment leaves with the principal. So we want to make sure that there's an, also an agreement between, and that shouldn't say school there, that should say LEA and partner organization. Okay. I feel like I wasn't super clear about that, but if you have questions, let me know. I do see some questions. Okay. If you are working with DCPS, who at DCPS can write the agreement? <coughs> so there's, a con there's an email address in the RFA. Uh, I recommend that you send an email to that email address. It's the... Um, it's the, I believe it's the grants email address in there, and you'll be in contact. There's a couple people in that office. I've been in communication with them regularly, um, and they will work on writing the agreement. They'll have a, they have a form letter agreement that they can work with you on. Um, yeah, I did get a lot of questions on that. Sorry, guys, I wasn't very clear. If you have a fiscal sponsor, do you also need a partner organization? Great question. Uh, it depends. So if you have a fiscal sponsor that also has the technical uh, skills, the ability to provide technical support on the project, then that fiscal, then the fiscal sponsor can serve a dual role as the partner organization and the fiscal sponsor. If you have DCPS central office, they're just going to be your fiscal sponsor. They're not going to be your partner organization. They, I, they don't, they're not going to be able to come out and tell you, what pest is eating your cabbage? They're not going to do that. You need another partner organization or whatever it is that you're doing. It can be very specific um, on what you need a partner organization for, but that's just an example. So, yes, you, you, it just depends on what the organization is. Laura, I hope that answered your question. Um, Susan, um, what are the third parties? Okay. <laughs> okay. So the question is um, about the indirect cost piece and who determines the indirect cost. Um, so the way it was explained to me was um, organizations apply for an indirect cost rate. 
they submit that application to the grants people here at Aussie that then gets sent along to a third party. I don't know who that third party is. I can find out. It's an organization that's been contracted out by Aussie to do this type of work, to determine um, indirect cost rates. Um, so they're going to come back with a rate for you, and I don't know what that looks like. I don't know exactly how it's decided, to be honest with you. I can follow up and give you some more detail on that. I'm writing that down as a note right now, so get that back to you. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions? Just hit me. Okay. A few program requirements to talk about. So the first one is we want to see a school wellness committee. We believe strongly that a school wellness committee is essential to the success of the school garden program. So we aren't specific about who's on that committee. Um, we aren't specific about how often that committee meets. That's up to you. But we want to see that there is a school wellness committee either established or if there already was one, that this program is helping to maintain and increase the capacity of that committee and that that committee is supporting the program. We also want to see a school garden coordinator or coordinators. Um, if there's already a garden coordinator at your school, we want to see how that how this program is increasing the capacity of that person's work by either adding an additional, an additional person or increasing the number, amount of time they can spend um, doing the work that they're already doing. Okay, um, If you are a new program and you don't have a garden coordinator identified at the time of submitting the application, that's okay. But I, I do encourage that folks start thinking about what this person would do and be really clear about that in the section that asks about the roles and responsibilities and or a um, job description of that person. We don't need to know the person's name. It's great if you have it, give us their name and tell us, give, them, give us their resume, whatever you have. But if you don't, it's not gonna count against you. We just wanna know as much as you can give us about what that person's gonna do. Okay, um, this is obvious. We want there to be a school garden. Um, and we also want you to send us the mid-project and end-project reports and be available for one site visit during the year. Okay, um, <clears throat> a little bit about the review process. So just to remind folks, this is a competitive grant. So um, last year we were very fortunate to um, have, to be able to give out more money. So we were able to more money than we had planned, so we always plan on giving the $200,000 out. Last year, we gave out $375,000. I don't know how much money we're going to have this year, but I know we'll have at least $200,000. If we get more, then we can give out more money. Um, like last year, we were, able to, we were able to award all of the applicants that we deemed that um, were, that the review committee deemed as good projects, basically. Um, this year, I'm hoping to do the same, but it is a competitive grant, so there's no guarantee. Um, we have external reviewers that read each application, um, and then we look at the scores. Um, we tally them up. We look at things like geographic, uh, ge we have things like geography. We look at things like need. We look at things like DCPS, and is it a DCPS school? Is it a public charter school? We look at grade level. We look at all these things and we try to equally distribute the awards. Um, so um, that's that's just um, how we that's how we do it. Um, luckily, we've been able to you know get do a good job of equally distributing the awards. Okay. Um, question. I don't know what the average grant size is. I haven't actually averaged it. That's a great question. Um, most people apply for the full amount. For fifteen thousand um, dollars, I would say the average amount is probably fourteen thousand dollars because most people apply for the full amount. But I, yeah, that's just off the top of my head. Um, one thing I will say though, um, to add on to that question, is I highly recommend that if your program costs more than fifteen thousand um, dollars, 
um, please tell us that and tell us how much more it costs and what you would be able to do um, if more money was available. Um, there, it's not outside the, the possibilities that um, you know we may be able to give out more money, and it would be great if you were able to say, oh, we're, we we can use these fifty fifteen thousand dollars to do X, Y, and Z. But if we had fifteen thousand dollars more, we could do these other things. That way, you know, it make it, it helps us understand maybe we need to make this award bigger. Or if we have extra funds to give out, then we know who to give it to. All right. Um, so the total of 68 points um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the grant application. And then there's an additional five bonus points for schools that have priority and focus status. Uh, so that means that those schools um, have been designated as schools that are high need. Um, based on test scores, and that's something that, uh, and a couple other things, I think. But that's something that Aussie uses to um, close close the achievement gap and also make sure that resources are distributed equally. So we do we do want to make sure that schools that have those status um, they get additional points, and then they are you know seen as you know high need or that they get those additional points. Um, I will be getting a list of priority and focus schools out and post it on the grants page in the, in the coming days. Um, but you could go online and type in priority, focus schools, Aussie, um, and you could get a list of, of those schools um, as well. Um, yeah, and then those are the categories. Um, that's all in the RFA that we will be scoring, and they're based on the narrative. And again, I can't be more, I, I think that the most important thing that I can say to folks is, you know, people have a lot of great ideas and that's awesome. Um, sometimes we get applications where there's just is full of ideas and there are great ideas in there, but it's really hard for us to understand what that program will look like. So for folks with a lot of ideas, I recommend that you whittle it down to something very simple and tangible that is very easy to understand by someone reading it that may not be familiar at all with your school or your organization or you know may just be somewhat familiar with school gardens. We try to get reviewers that at least know what school gardens are and what's, what, what school gardens do and the benefits. But you just have to assume that the reviewer you know knows very little, but you also need to you know be concise. So it's tricky, um, but the worst thing I think that I see is just people with a ton of good ideas, and they just throw them all out there, and <laughs> it's just it's it's great to read, but it's hard to score. Um, so we're gonna let people know that they received the awards on March 7th, and that's when the grant award notifications will be sent out to awardees, and that will include the terms and conditions. Those grant award notifications need to be agreed by and signed and returned, and that's um, all going to go through the EGMS system. Um, so it's all, you know, it's all taken care of through that system. The grant period starts a couple, uh, a week later. So you're going to find that you're going to have basically a week between when you find out you got the award. I'm hoping to get them out before March 7th, and when the grant period starts to you know, get as much, um, you know, get everything together as quickly as possible. We don't expect people to start you know, on the first day of the grant, but if you can, it's great. Um, yeah, and then the last thing is that this is a reimbursement grant. So I just want to remind folks that, um, yeah, that we can, only we can only make a payment if there's proof that you've already incurred the costs. So when reimbursement requests are sent in, we need to see that, for example, if it's for a, a school garden coordinator's stipend, that that check has already been cut. So we would actually need to see a copy of the check that has been paid out to Mrs. School Garden Coordinator. Um, and that way we know that payment has been made and we can make payment. What, what happens often is people will send in like a timesheet 
and that's not proof of payment for us and we can't accept that so we'll reject it and ask for you to send in proof of payment um, so just make sure also that your fiscal sponsor has enough capital to be able to manage a grant for you know a reimbursement grant um, sometimes people don't fully realize that and then they get a little bit stressed out um, I'm almost done so <clears throat> a few expectations we we expect the school garden coordinator to be identified by the by the fiscal sponsor or the school in a timely manner um, there's no again like set date but once you know you get the award and you haven't identified a school garden coordinator highly recommend that you start actively looking for one and that's something that I can help with um, if you don't know who it's going to be I can help you know get the word out try to find someone that will be a good fit um, we expect the garden coordinators to attend four full day trainings that are during aligned with DCPS professional development days. So this often answers the question, uh, you know, can a teacher be a school garden coordinator? Um, it's probably not a great idea because we need them to attend these full day trainings and we also need them to, you know, be able to do all the extra work that we ask for the school garden coordinator to do. They could be one of the people, one of the school garden coordinators, maybe, but it might be really hard for a teacher to take on the full the full load of that. Um, of course, any changes to the grant, we would like um, grantees to let us know as soon as possible, and we can work with you. Sometimes what happens is, you know, you 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 budget for a certain item, it was less expensive, or you don't need it anymore, it got donated, and now you need to amend your budget. We can work with you on that. We want to make sure that all the money is spent. We don't want anyone to have any money left over because um, it'll just go to fill potholes or something else we want to all go to school gardens um, and then lastly reports um, are completed on time and are complete um, we really rely on those reports to um, drive this process um, okay just a quick rundown so now you've received the award what happens next the grant period starts on March 14th the first training is on April 5th so I think April 5th is a really good deadline for folks to have their school garden coordinator person set up. That gives you like a month to get someone in place so they can attend the first training. I'll be coming out the month of April and June, or April, May, and June to um, do an official site visit. We'll it'll take about an hour. Um, I'll want to see the garden, maybe observe a lesson, talk with the garden coordinator. And then you have mid-projects reports due. And then October, November, and February are the uh, required trainings. And then the grant ends on March 13th. Um, the grant ends on March 13th, and then you have some time to submit your report and your reimbursement requests. OK. Um, please remember, I am sorry about the typo. You have until the 15th of January to submit any questions. Um, so you have a while to think about it. And that's all I got. That's all I have for folks. Does anybody have any any questions? Here, let me unmute people. Can I unmute everybody? See if I have any questions. Hey, Sam, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, cool. Um, this is Nadia. And I was wondering, when you said that a teacher, like, can be one of the school garden coordinators. Do you mean like you could we could give a teacher liaison a stipend through the Aussie grant of like a few thousand dollars and then call them a school garden coordinator and then give the rest to an outside school garden coordinator that we hire? I think yes. I think it's best to think about the 80% really as staffing rather than rather than school garden coordinator um, some organizations what they've been able to do is they do exactly that Nadia they provide a stipend to a teacher or teachers to do to um, you know do some lesson planning um, around the garden or to work directly with other teachers that extra time that they're spending that's definitely good that's that's great if that's your model and that works for you then yes okay Thanks. Yep. Um, this is Laura. I was just confused still about the um, indirect cost information. Do we have to sub get that rate, I guess, before we submit the application? Yeah. Um, 
I don't think so. And I will get some clarity on that, but it's my understanding that you can get that rate at any time. Um, so the only problem then is you're submitting your budget, so you want to know how much you have yeah, allocated to indirect costs. If you're on the phone and there's some noise in the background, can you put your phone on mute? Because I've unmuted everybody. Thank you. Um, um, thank you. So I will get that answer back to you very quickly. But I would I would look at the RFA. Um, I think that there's some information in there about is there information in there on who to contact? I'll have to double check. But let me get let me get back to you, okay, Laura. Um, I, I need to look okay. into that. I'm, uh, this is something new, and so I'm just kind of wrapping my head around it right now. Okay. I will say though that the in, that the indirect cost rate, um, very few school. I don't think any schools have applied and received a rate. And I don't think, and I'm I'm gonna say this, and I don't think I'm wrong, but I might be that schools have an indirect cost rate of zero. So if you're a, uh, a school applying, like an LEA or a PTO probably, that your indirect cost rate is probably going to be zero. Um, but I, I could be wrong. But I'm just, that's what I think is right. <laughs> uh, does the same person have to go to all four mandatory PDs? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's not required that the same person go, but it's preferable. I mean, the, the PDs are all different, and they sca they're they scaffold, so they build on each other. And um, unless there's like a real reason, um, like an intentional reason why you wouldn't want the same person to go, then let us know that. You can also, you know, we could talk about sending two people from your school to the PDs. Um, that could work too. Okay. Uh, mute, your, mute your phone if you're not on mute, please. Thank you. I just unmuted everybody. I'm going to mute people. I'm muting people. Okay. Um, you're muted. So text or uh, put something in the um, text box if you want to talk. Uh, okay. W what would be included in indirect costs under this RFA for a fiscal agent? That is community nonprofit. Okay, so uh, that's a great question. So indirect costs is kind of like overhead costs. So it would be administrative expenses that you're incurring as an organization to manage this grant. So it's not something that you have to like line item, but it's just a set percentage of the grant that you're saying this is a cost that we're incurring as an organization to administer this grant. Hope that helps. Um, some of you say reply in, in, in private, but I'm just saying them out loud. I won't say who you are. Um, so this is going to be this presentation will be posted online, and so you'll have access to it with the audio, with all the crazy audio going on. But yeah, you can listen to it, and then you can of course email um, follow up with me as well. Um, the date scheduled. I don't have a date. It'll probably be, honestly, it'll probably be after the holidays, to be honest with you. I'm going to try to get it in before. Um, if it's not in by tomorrow, then it'll be after the holidays because everything's going to be pretty shut down here. Um, but you can call me. Um, okay, next question. Can a school use funding towards a partner organization for technical support uh, hold on, let me read this. Yes, okay. So the question is basically, like, does this, can the school learning coordinator be a person who's a part of an outside organization that is being contracted by the school to provide services? And the answer is absolutely yes. So that happens a lot. There'll be an, an outside organization that'll be partnering with the school they will provide the school garden coordinator, or maybe someone who's currently on their staff, um, to provide all the services that you need. Um, and also, I'm reading this a little bit more, so you could also have an organization provide technical support, pay them to provide technical support, and then also 
have a school garden coordinator from a different organization or from the school community or a community member be the garden coordinator. So all of those things work. We really aren't, we understand that there's no one way to run a school garden program. So we're not trying to dictate like the structure of your garden program. The only thing that's really important to us is that you are, that this, the money is going towards staffing because that's the number one barrier for school gardens in the district and in the country. So as long as you're showing us that you are allocating 80% or more of your funds for staffing to run your garden program and it makes sense, then go for it. Any combination of those things, you're paying stipends for teachers, you're paying a school garden coordinator, um, you're, you're paying a community member, you're paying a nonprofit. We just want it to be in the staffing column and we want there to be somebody that is responsible for the garden who's going to manage the day-to-day -day operation of the garden program. So that's what's important. Okay. Um, any other questions in the chat? I think people might be on the phone, so I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do one more unmute people. One more unmute. Any other questions? Okay, thank you guys. Have a good night. Have a good night. All right, take care. Thank you. Yep.